Mr. President, Professor S. M. Griffin, Professor Woodwardia, Chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Raman Goel, currently President of Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons, who is going to deliver the presidential oration during Indo-UK Surgicon 2020 IAGS and RCS Edinburgh Collaborative Conference. Dr. Robin Coel has obtained master's degree in surgery from Jain Medical College, Aligarh in 1989. Subsequent to his training in Europe, he was appointed as Honorary Assistant Professor of Surgery in 1994 and was promoted as Associate Professor and trained hundreds of surgical postgraduates during 16 years of his work at the prestigious Grant Medical College and JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. He became Fellow of International College of Surgeons, FIAGS, and Honorary Falls in Advanced MAS Surgery by IAGS and Honorary FMBS by Obesity Surgery Society in February 2020. He was granted FRCS Edinburgh during the last on-site convocation on 13th March 2020. In the year 2000, he became second surgeon to start bariatric surgery in India and from 2011, he started practicing bariatric and metabolic surgery exclusively with several unique distinctions to his credit as follows. He is the first Indian surgeon of excellence in bariatric and metabolic surgery by Surgical Review Corporation USA in 2016 to 2019. His center of excellence in bariatric and metabolic surgery by Surgical Review Corporation USA in 2016-2019. Center of excellence in bariatric and metabolic surgery by Obesity Surgery Society of India 2019 and 2021. Currently, he is the director, center of metabolic surgery, Wokart Hospital, Mumbai, India. He is founder member of Obesity Surgery Society of India. He was president of All Indian Association of Advancing Research in Obesity and hosted 5th Asia Oceania Conference of Obesity in 2009 in Mumbai. He is current president, Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Indosurgeons. He is in the board of governors of ELSA and IFSES both. He is the chairman of Scientific Committee, World Congress of Endoscopic Society, uh, Surgery, WCES, in 20, 2024. He has over 20 publications in peer-reviewed index journals, editor of textbooks of laparoscopy, and has contributed multiple chapters in various books. He was co-chief editor of Journal of Obesity and Metabolic Research. He is an associate editor of Journal of Medieval Access Surgery. He is an editorial board member of Indian Journal of Surgery. He is reviewer for International Journal of Obesity, SOARD, Obesity Surgery, GMS, and Indian Journal of Obesity. He is a great team person with unique leadership qualities. He has been very enthusiastic and dynamic president and has been a great driving force in IAGS in establishing several unique developments even in the adverse COVID-19 pandemic. Dignitaries and delegates, it is indeed a great honor and privilege to present before you Dr. Raman Goel to deliver the presidential oration on improving bariatric outcomes during Indo-UK Surgicon Conference on this day, 15th October 2020. Dr. Raman Goel. Thank you, Sainda. Uh, that was a great privilege to hear these words from you. The man who immediately preceded me and the way from whom I have learned most of the administrative qualities of a president. So Sainde Das Gupta, who was who is immediate past president right now, I worked with him as treasurer of the association, and we have worked very closely for the last four years. Uh, for the association. So thank you so much for the kind words. Friends, before I go to my oration, I would like to say that IAGS had been a great learning experience for me. I, 
I became member of IAGS in 1996. But I realized that these associations bring people together. And they are they help a person evolve beyond beyond the beyond the, the technical aspect as a person, help them mature, help them learn interaction, and help them support others who, who need that support at a particular time in life. So thank you, all, all the seniors, all the youngsters, and all the team members who had been working with me tirelessly to make this conference successful and many other ventures that we have done in last one year uh, uh, with IIGS. I'll, I'll start my screen share. So I bring greetings on behalf of uh, my Center for Metabolic Surgery, which is in Mumbai. And, uh, and uh, it's a, it's a great honor that I speak at a, at, a, at a program which has been jointly organized. This had been a dream program for me for the last three years. I had offered Dr. Sainthev Das Gupta during his presidency that we should have this program in Edinburgh. But he was of the view that you should do it. And when it got cancelled because of COVID, I was really very disappointed. But once uh, Dr. Pavaninder agreed to host it, on a virtual platform, uh, there was no looking back. And I'm so grateful to the leadership of Royal College of Surgeons to, to support us all the way. The topic of my oration that I chose was on improving bariatric outcomes. I am doing only bariatric surgeries for the last 10 years. From 2011, I stopped doing general surgeries. So I do only laparoscopic bariatric surgeries. And it had been a ongoing struggle to, to make the surgery simpler, safer, and to improve outcomes. And today, in this next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to share my experience, my journey through in the bariatric world. This is the, the core team that we have, which, which includes a physician, my, my fellow the dietitians, my uh, gastroenterologist colleagues. And bariatric, as we all know, is a teamwork. And I have learned a lot from my team because they bring in newer ideas. And I, I fall back on them on a daily basis to, to, to learn more and more from them. And they have brought me to a situation where I am today. Uh, I have no disclosures related to this uh, talk today. Important thing to realize is that as on 20, 2020, I do about 60% through and by gastric bypass, and my sleeves have gone down to about 39%. While whole, the whole of India is doing about 29% one anastomosis gastric bypass, I continue to do uh, only about 1% one, uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass. And uh, this mix keeps changing every two to three years, and I believe there is a valid reason for that. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge all those patients who came to a medical college, a public hospital, and trusted me at a time uh, when I was very young. And uh, even I was not sure about my capabilities, and they trusted me more. And all those patients who come very well informed with, with Google knowledge and who challenge our team's understanding, my understanding, on a daily basis. And that that pushes her to us to learn more about disease and about surgery. So even after about 12 years of doing laparoscopic surgeries, once I started bariatric surgery, suddenly there was a crisis of confidence. You know, we were doing laparoscopic inguinal hernias in 2004, sorry, 1994 or so. We were doing nephrectomies in 1996. And then when we came for bariatric, it was it was a major crisis because we don't we didn't understand the disease well we were not sure how the procedure will work out in long run how safe it will be what will be the outcomes and this reflected in my conversation with my patients and they had lack of confidence in surgery and surgeon and this was a major major crisis for me the turning point, the first turning point in bariatric journey came when I joined this association. My mentor, Dr. Dhore Patil, took me to one of these meetings. 
where they were all physicians and dietitians and endocrinologists sitting and we used to have conversations going for hours and i learned so much from them that the i basically realized how the obesity works how the comorbidities happen i think these were equally important as as any surgical technique i learned to understand the the, the the how to how to explain the expectations of patients of uh, what is actual weight loss and what is the difficulty in maintaining weight i think those were very important learning points and the second turning point came when i visited professor mel phobi for my asmbs preceptorship this was a, again a major issue because this gentleman would do technical modifications of the standard procedures and was able to improve outcomes first time i realized because till that time i knew a god cholecystectomy is cholecystectomy but first time i realized doing few extra steps and you can assure patient better outcomes so i realized that surgery is beyond the basic technical skill it's it's developing the excellence in your technique and once i came back i started deconstructing surgery and deconstructing post operative care so standardized uh, surgical steps and try to improve post operative care and counseling for the patients and i think that helped a lot in long run then somewhere in 2008 uh, as the metabolic surgery became fashionable all over the world i traveled to the other part of the world in brazil to visit dr orio de paula to see him operate and pick up some fine points on island transposition that gentleman is is a basically a physiologist he's a surgeon master surgeon but he explained me the physiology of diabetes how liver is so important in insulin resistance what is the role of nerves in diabetes and all those things and how he applies it for surgical improvisations so i think his number of publications and his safe outcomes because he was a outlier in his own country and he was very very careful that there should be no complications made me focus more on safe outcomes and importance of publications in this during this time between 2008 and 2010 uh michel gagne started visiting us for uh, operating some of our patients in india on a regular basis and i saw the kind of excellence that he had and kind of practicality so if he goes for a patient with with for a ruin y gastric bypass and find that there are difficulties without any element of guilt he would go ahead and do a sleeve because his take was that you do a, a, health, a living patient is more important than somebody who, where you can have a possibility of giving a complication and despite all these learnings and after 400 uneventful sleeve gastrectomies in 2009 i had two sleeve two leaks in sleeves and as people say statistics ultimately catches up we went through these videos again and again and we found there was nothing nothing different that we could have done we didn't learn much from seeing those videos and that was the time when i started looking at other contributing factors besides standardized surgery why some patients will develop leak and others not develop is there something that we are doing which is which is the reason why a particular patient or why some surgical programs have more leaks so we started doing some improvisations now these improvisations included some surgical improvisations some non surgical improvisations like over sewing like using glue one of the thing that i i had during a discussion with the nutritionist was not for the complications but for the purpose of improving outcomes was portion control eating that nutritionists keep patients who are obese patients on portion control eating uh, without surgery and we started following this and we published this later uh, with my fellow and my nutritionist as part of the team and this is what i am going to explain to you in detail this was based on a hypothesis that if patient is given measurable food intake from early post operative period this limits patient's calorie intake 
and it maximizes food loss, weight loss. Now, this hypothesis is contradictory to what most of the bariatric surgeons are told that patient can eat till full, patient eats for satiety. But the but with even with this, there are variable surgical outcomes, even though everybody does the same surgery. And this eat till full breaks down uh, a reflex that most of the obese people or patients with obesity develop throughout their life that they eat limited amount of food. And this, if when it breaks down, it leads to a tendency of overeating even after bariatric surgery. Is it responsible for higher complication rate? I have no way of establishing that unless we follow these patients. And then we read so many st in the studies that patients, 15, 20% patients with have persistent vomiting after surgery, which was not happening with our patients after portion control eating. Is it responsible for early stretching of pouch when it is still in a healing phase and that leads to less weight loss and weight regain? I don't know. So portion, why portion control? Because we the science tells us that it takes 20 minutes for feeling of fullness to reach from the stomach to the mind. And most of us end up eating, completing our meal faster than 20 minutes. We end up a meal within 5 to 10 minutes. So even before we realize that we have satiated, we end up eating more. And this is probably what was happening in bariatric patients who do not follow portion control meals. And this is what we started telling. So we, we started this study after we realized that this is probably something that we have in mind. And from 2012, so all the patients who had uh, surgery in 2012 and 13 were included. Uh, as you see, at that time, we were doing about 90% sleeves. And that two, at two years, years follow-up, 82% patients followed up of sleeve and 77% of bypass. And this is basically portion control algorithm for us. So on day one of surgery, patient is given 30 ml liquid every hour. And then patient waits for 20 minutes. And then they have a feeling of satiety even with 30 ml liquids. And this is gradually increased if the person is not satiated after 20 minutes by adding one teaspoon each time. And this goes on when they go on a soft diet. This goes on when they go on a full diet. One teaspoon of food is added each time. So they, they need to eat a limited food quantity and they need to wait for about 20 minutes. It is not difficult for the patients to follow. It is difficult for surgeons to accept because patients have been doing this even before surgery. Now, what were the outcomes? Our patients of sleeve had a mean BMI of about 45, almost similar BMI with bypass. And their netted BMI was about 29 in sleeve and 27 with bypass. And look at the percentage excess weight loss of 87% at sleeve and 94% after bypass. Now, this was, this, was, this was better than most of the publications. And we, we saw most of the randomized control trials where the, the follow-up of sleeve were done. So, sorry, uh, this was somewhere between 49 to 81%, 69 to 83%, 77% to 87%, and likewise. So we were on the higher side. The weight loss was on the higher side than even with randomized control trials. Then we went through the literature, and we found that there are studies. One study has been done after bariatric surgery but there the portion control was not started early it was started quite late when patients regained weight and the, at one year post bypass portion control intervention showed better weight loss with, with the in these patients versus those who were in in a standard bariatric diet and one particular uh, nutrition program in us is probably planning to start a comparative trial like this in their patients and then we know that there, there are eating disorders and all these things which happens in patients with vomiting in about 12% patients and bulimic episodes in 25% patients. So now these, these, these are significantly controlled with portion control eating. So friends, philosophically speaking, portion control is to eat one, what one should and not what one can. So patients, our patients, 
take a particular portion in the plate and they eat with that set meal and they finish it and then they wait for 20 minutes and if they are full they don't eat more and my my favorite uh, statement is we control portion and then portion controls us so i think this is very important and this was probably a simple solution of a, an apparently complex problem we subsequently published our three year follow up results and uh, here we had uh, data of 88% sleep 12% bypass 76% follow up and you can see the weight loss was quite good uh, with bypass at three years it was still about 86% and comorbidity resolution was also quite good with diabetes uh, off medication about 92% with bypass and uh, 80% uh, of hypertensive medication and GERD and joint pain improvements. Uh, complication rates in this particular group of patients, as you can see, besides the de novo GERD, leak mortality and revisional surgeries in these patients of those two years, three, uh, two years of follow up, three years of follow up of those patients was zero percent and this we had been able to maintain for many years and this is something that keeps baffling us that is it the diet post-operative diet which was the reason for many of these major complications subsequently we published about five years sleeve outcome studies saying is sleeve gastrectomy over criticized and even here we see a weight loss of about 69 percent at five years uh, in about uh, 70% uh, follow-up rate. And this is, again, comparing it with various randomized control trial, shows a weight loss, which is uh, which is almost at par with the randomized control trial. And this is, this is, uh, this is, is important for us. Then uh, we did a survey last year of uh, uh, Indian bariatric programs. And we were amazed that 84% of Indian bariatric nutritionists are following portion control method for meals instead of eat until full. And this also reflects in the complication data that we have from India, uh, which I am not here, but I uh, will probably share some other time, which shows that overall complications in India are around 3.5%. Now, besides this portion control eating, I have other outcome studies. I'll quickly run through it. One of the one of the important uh, guidelines that we came across, which is uh, the ASMBS guideline, was that patients should be put on two weeks of liquid diet to reduce weight and to reduce liver volume. But please note the highlighted part. This guideline was downgraded due to inconsistent evidence. And this guideline came because of my friend, uh, uh, from New Zealand had published the paper somewhere in 2006 that how the liver size reduces. So I believe that this was a barrier to bariatric surgery because before that patients were routinely operated without any liquid diet. So we did a study with our sonologist who measured the, the liver in various dimensions, including the dimension in which Dr. Uh, Rob Fraser had, had got it measured. And we found that the craniocaudal dimension of left liver lobe is, is corroborating with our surgical uh, measurement. And there was no surgical difficulty in less than 15 centimeters. We are writing another paper on this. It's unpublished data that pre-op liquid diet is not required in most patients with less than 15 centimeters left liver lobe. Now, if this is true and if it is replicated in uh, many other centers, probably 98% of the patients who are being put on liquid diet uh, need not to go on that before surgery. Another aspect that we did was that we involved a multidisciplinary team whenever we had difficulty. And this particular diagnosis, which is uh, mesenteric paniculitis, which we published uh, uh, three years back, I believe, uh, first case series after bariatric surgery with patients presenting with effusion, ascites, parietal thickening, and and uh, gradually progressive obstruction, intestinal obstruction, uh, with diagnosed on only on CT scan and.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, greetings to all of you from the IAGES uh, organization. Um, now, uh, let me let me first uh, start off by um, by thanking uh, IAGES for giving me this opportunity uh, to wrap up this session. Uh, the HPP session of the Indo UK Surgicon 2020. Uh, I hope uh, all of you have enjoyed listening to these lectures, uh, the recorded lectures, uh, as much as uh, you have enjoyed the, the, the real conference in October 2020. And uh, I have to say, it was a it was an absolute uh, uh, privilege and uh, pleasure and honor for me to have. Uh, being the scientific committee secretary for this uh, historical conference. Um, I, 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 I thank the, the president and the uh, IEGS committee for having bestowed that responsibility on me. And I have to admit that I would not have been able to uh, deliver my duties in, in compiling this uh, scientific committee, uh, scientific program without the help advice, guidance of uh, all my colleagues and seniors within IAGES, and I immensely uh, thank them for that. Uh, just to give you a bit of a background of this, uh, uh, of this scientific program, we, we actually started preparing on the scientific uh, program some 10 or 11 months before the actual conference. Uh, we had initially designed it for the um, for the real conference, but unfortunately, COVID pandemic broke out, and so we had to redesign the, the program uh, to fit in with a virtual conference. And that was quite challenging because uh, we, we none of us had uh, um, uh, much of experience about conducting virtual conferences, and there was no precedent to it. So many of us were learning uh, along the way about how to uh, get this conference as lively and as, as interesting as possible. So uh, we had several brainstorming sessions. Uh, many of us, we, we, uh, we, we got together. Um, I think we, we must have had about 10 or 15 uh, meetings over a period of six months before we decided on this final uh, scientific uh, program, which I, I hope all of you would have liked. And we tried to keep this scientific program as balanced as possible. In, in keeping with the motto of IAGES, we wanted to make sure that there's an equal representation of all subspecialties. So it was a two-day conference. We tried to divide the time equally. Uh, we divided the entire conference into eight subheadings, um, you know, hernia, colorectal, endoscopy, and upper GI on day one, uh, general laparoscopy, bariatric, HPV, and robotics on day two. And we also ensured that the, the pattern uh, for each of those subheadings was exactly the same um, so that there is no discrepancy so that the audience gets a gets gets a good flavor of the uh, of the um, uh, of, of the various uh, uh, specialties that they are interested in and um, um, it was it was challenging because it was almost like uh, having uh, four uh, 
four conferences in parallel on one day and uh, like having eight different themed conferences over a period of uh, two days uh, but i i'm i'm happy that it uh, it went on well and we had uh, thousands of delegates logged in from not just from india but from all over the world and the feedback that we received was excellent and uh, um, and uh, i i thank everybody uh, who has been behind this uh, conference to make it a grand success um on top of that i would also like to add that we had a number of uh, free papers submitted to us in the form of abstracts from uh, trainees again from all over the world uh, unfortunately the timing was limited so we could only accommodate four free papers in one subheading um, so um, so that left with uh, almost 100 to 150 free papers which we had to uh, leave out and but then we thought we should give them a platform uh, to to present and so between sessions we had a number of uh, trainees present their work and they were also marked by a team of uh, judges and prizes were given uh, towards the uh, end of the conference um so um, there there was a lot of uh, hard work which went behind the uh, the, the, the scientific program and uh, um and it is a team effort and i thank each and every one who has been behind um this uh, this work to make this conference a grand success and i hope uh, you are continuing to enjoy the the, the recordings of this uh, conference which is being telecasted now and for the last few weeks um uh with regards to uh, the hpb session um i'm I'm happy to say that uh, in addition to um, uh, to being the scientific committee secretary, I was also given the uh, extra responsibility of uh, working closely with my uh, colleague, Dr. Rajesh Gurjwani, uh, to coordinate the HPB session of the conference on day two. And uh, and as you have as you may have already noted, it was a uh, it was a program with lots of uh, uh, variety in it. There was plenty of uh, lectures on laparoscopic hepatic surgery laparoscopic pancreatic surgery spleen uh, splenectomies and uh, there was a very interesting uh, debate there was a, a very interesting panel discussion too and uh, i i hope all of you have uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, all the sessions in the in the hpb part of uh, of this conference and um, um, in the last uh, few few days i i uh, uh, you, you have listened to these lectures and a few of uh, and a few questions have come up and uh, i thought i would just briefly uh, uh, try to answer uh, these these questions the first of which was on the role of uh, hepatico duodenostomy as a reconstruction procedure after colidocal excisions um i think the, the the question was about whether hepatic duodenostomy uh, was uh, better or worse than hepatic jejunostomy well uh, the uh, it is a debatable uh, topic but uh, what the literature says about this is that hepatic duodenostomy is uh, definitely an easier procedure to perform it takes less operating time Uh, there's faster return of uh, bowel function after hepatic duodenostomy as compared to, in comparison to a hepatic jejunostomy and uh, there is uh, it's it's more of a physiological uh, anastomosis um, and it's associated with uh, less incidence of adhesive small bowel obstruction and less incidence of anastomotic leakage so certainly there are lots of benefits with that uh, however um, Uh, the question of whether there's any uh, role of this procedure in adults uh, well almost all the papers that i have gone through are talking about this procedure in, in children so i'm not aware of any uh, papers that say hepatic duodenostomy is better than hepatic jejunostomy when it comes to colidocal cyst excisions in adults uh, i hope that answers the uh, answers your question uh, the next question was on uh, the uh, recent Uh, technological advancements in hydatid cysts 
management, liver hydrated cysts management. Well, there are a number of acron acronyms, a number of abbreviations that have been described in world literature when it comes to minimally invasive uh, techniques for hydrated cysts management. Just to name a few, this PAIR, which is probably the most popular one, which stands for puncture, aspiration, injection, and re-aspiration. There's also something called percutaneous evacuation of cystic contents, uh, PVAC, uh, and there's something called modified catheterization technique called MOCAT, M-O-C-A-T. Uh, now, these are minimally invasive techniques, no doubt. Uh, however, uh, the literature is very clear about when you should use these techniques and when you shouldn't. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the criteria is that the, the hepatic uh, hydratic cyst lesions, they have to be less than 5 centimeters and uh, they, they should not be calcified cysts, they should not be inactive cysts. And also, these kind of minimally invasive percutaneous techniques are not uh, uh, advisable for, or in fact, it's a contraindication if the cyst is communicating with the biliary tree. Um, and, uh, and and of course, these these are not appropriate for recurrent cysts. So, so the answer to your question is definitely a role for these procedures. However, uh, the surgeon or the or the, or the, or the clinician for that matter, the physician or surgeon, or they need to be very uh, careful about how they choose their patients for these procedures. Um, the, the, the other question was on uh, persistent biliary fistulas. Um, I presume the questioner is talking about a biliary fistula that is uh, ongoing for several weeks. Um, after after a, a bile duct injury that was sustained during a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, well, uh, the, the short answer to that is uh, yes. Surgery is the is the way forward because uh, I, I again I assume that uh, this patient has already uh, had an ERCP stenting and has and, and the endoscopist has also tried a bridging stent and that hasn't worked and there is a drain place in the subhepatic fossa. And there's an ongoing bile leakage, and there is uh, radiological confirmation of major bile duct injury. Um, so yes, so the answer to that question is yes. This patient will require surgery, will require some form of biliary reconstruction surgery. Uh, but what I would like to emphasize here is that uh, uh, when it comes to uh, biliary reconstruction surgery, uh, the the timing of it is extremely important. Um, uh, the literature says that if a bile duct injury is sustained at the time of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the best repair is done by an expert surgeon then and there. Uh, an immediate surgical, an immediate recognition followed by an immediate repair by the most experienced, the best surgeon, hepatobiliary surgeon, gives the best results. However, logistically, that may not be always possible because. Uh, um, you may not have an expert hepatobiliary surgeon to do the procedure when the injury uh, occurs um, uh, in every hospital and therefore the, the, the discussion goes uh, to, to other aspects as to you know what should be done then and what should be done thereafter. Well the standard teaching is if the injury has happened you, you place a drain um, and you send the patient to a tertiary referral center and uh, and uh, uh, subsequently, the patient has proper evaluation of the biliary injury and the and the repair is performed. Now, there's uh, this debate about what would be the ideal time to do it, whether it is six weeks or four weeks or two months. Well, more than uh, yes, we can go on discussing about that. But what has been universally agreed is that whatever time you take the patient back to theater, it's extremely important that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the the collections as much of uh, as much of as much as possible the collections are drained as much as possible the inflammation and the infection component is uh, is is less is reduced and the patient's nutritional condition is as good as possible so if these three things are taken care of and uh, and if there is the uh, if there is expert surgeon available and uh, if the patient is in a tertiary referral center, uh, the biliary reconstruction surgery uh, can go ahead. 
So I, I, I hope uh, I have uh, answered those, those three questions that have uh, come along in the last few days during this recording. Uh, and again, I thank all of you uh, who, who have logged in and who have been watching these programs. Um, so lastly, um, I just want to uh, use this platform to pass on a message. The Honorary Secretary has asked me to inform all of you that uh, the online FIAGS courses will be resuming shortly, possibly within a month or so, um, after a short period uh, of, of uh, after a short gap over the last few months. And uh, further information regarding those courses will be available on the website iages.in. Uh, if any of you are, is interested in uh, applying for those courses, please visit the websites uh, or please get in touch with the Honorary Secretary uh, of IAGES. Once again, I thank all of you uh, for uh, participating in these in the in the programs, and I hope this was beneficial for you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Professor Utwali sir, for your passion for perfection, courage, and conviction. We we'll move on to the next oration. It's to be given by our IPSIS president, the International Federation of Society of Endoscopic Surgeons, Dr. Zundal, a Colombian surgeon by birth, but a global surgeon by his sheer hard work. I'm sure he is going to take the inspiration and give all the inspiration to the youngsters across the globe by his oration to do the introduction and do the honors i invite our president of iags dr raman goy over to you sir friends it's my great privilege and honor to present dr natan zundel currently the president of hipsis to deliver the presidential oration during indo uk surgicon 2020 jointly organized by iags and the Royal College of Surgeons at Edinburgh. He is the clinical professor of surgery at the Department of Surgery, University at Buffalo, New York, and also functions as bariatric surgeon at Jackson North Medical Center in Miami. Dr. Zundel has extensive experience with minimally invasive and bariatric surgical procedures. He is an active member of the following societies, namely American College of Surgeons, SAGES, IPSO, IPSIS, and American Society of Gastroenterology. Dr. Zundel has served as active honorary member of surgical, laparoscopic, and bariatric societies in 44 countries around the world. He was the president of several international surgical societies and meetings, including the World Congress of Endoscopic Surgery in 2012, International Federation for Obesity Surgery, 2015-16, and the Latin American chapter of IFSO, 2013-15. He currently serves as president and governor for the ACS South Florida chapter. Dr. Zundel was elected executive director of PHILAC on March 2017, a federation that comprises around 30,000 general surgeons from Latin America for the next four years. He has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals, book chapters and other educational platforms. He currently serves on several editorial boards, including Bariatric Times, Surgery for Obesity and Related Diseases, Obesity Surgery, Surgical Laparoscopy, Endoscopy, Surgical Endoscopy. Dr. Zundel has lectured extensively all over the world on minimally invasive and bariatric topics. He also trained and proctored hundreds of surgeons, fellows and surgical residents on bariatric and minimally invasive procedures. Dr. Zundel was awarded the academic rank of professor of surgery at various universities in four different countries. He received now the biggest honor for a surgeon in his native country, Masters of Colombian Surgery 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and privilege to present before you Dr. Natan Zundel to deliver the presidential oration on the endoscopic management of bariatric complications during Indo-UK Surgicon 2020 conference on this day, 16th October 2020. Raman, thank you for the presentation. You took most of my time, so I don't have to make my lecture now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation for the society because not only it's a pleasure to be here, but also I had the opportunity to hear the presentation of, of my friend from many years, the Hampton, it was very inspiring. I see friends like Pradeep here, so it is a pleasure for me to be here. And I'm gonna share my screen. Thank you very much. So I've been asked to, to discuss a little bit about the, the endoscopic management of what only in America we call adverse events, but uh, it's complications. So. This is my disclosure of any companies that I, I, I can mention here before. So let's start with the easy one, that is the ban. Uh, we know that uh, since it was approved only in the U.S., more than 300 bans have been performed in the world. And we know that the, the difficulties with the ban uh, can rise up to major complication, 40% at 10 years. <clears throat> Revisional rates up to 30%. So uh, there are some that endoscopy cannot do much, like the band prolapse. Most of this one, we deflate them and ended up uh, removing the band and converted to a sleeve or a bypass. Uh, when we have reflux of motility disorders, endoscopy cannot do much also. We need to remove this band. Uh, even that I learned that most of this reflux is not reflux. If it's stasis, but cause 
pochitis and cause also inflammation of the esophagus. So the band has to be removed. Endoscopy play a role in here. Endoscopy play a big role in band erosions. And band erosions have been reported up to 3%. But our group who did almost 4,000 bands since 1995, uh, we know that the erosion can go up to 11% with, with time if you don't remove the band in the first 10 years. So we decided not to take these patients anymore to surgery. And I'm not going to show you the regular endoscopic removal of a band because we do that every day. We publish more than 10 years ago how to remove a band by endoscopy. But I want you to show you other stuff that we're doing that maybe is more interesting is band that just have not eroded enough. They just even have a very small erosion like this one, and uh, bands that you assume you better take, you see very small erosion there. This band you think you need to take to surgery to remove it. We're doing some knife surgery in those ones. We inflate as much as we can the band to create some pressure. And then we go by surgery, and then we as above the band, like we will do in surgery, we make the band appear more by endoscopy. Then, as you know, when you have more than 30% of the band in your view, including the belt, we do that. Four days later, we come back, and then we finish this uh, removal, and then you will be able to remove it later with erosion. Some groups are doing something different. We did it before. Some groups inflate the band as much as they can and they put a stent and they remove the stent after seven days and the contact between the stent and the band inflated create that erosion we find this be safer and then you can remove the band as you can see here so you don't have to take these patients to surgery and then three to six months later you can convert this procedure to whatever you want and the band is not there anymore what about the other the other bariatric procedures? So uh, even that the sleeve is the new girl in town, the bypass is still done at least in the US 17%. There are two countries in the world that are still doing more bypass than the sleeve, and that is Brazil and uh, Swiss. So uh, there are a number of problems you can have there. For me, it's important if they are early, they are late, or they are big or they are not that big. Uh, in the bypass, and now some of the SADs and uh, uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass, you need to define if the complications are surgical or metabolic. For metabolic, we cannot do that much for endoscopy. There is a lot of problems that can happen there. And for that, I only have this solution. <laughs> So if the problem is metabolic, look for the origin. That's a very easy thing to do. So look what is going on and, and, and repair that one. But if the problem is surgical, it cannot be that easy. And if you uh, recall, or many of you have done bariatric surgery, you know that there are many places, many things that can happen in a bypass, and it can happen since day one until the day you die. Because you never uh, away from complications when you have a bypass, and that is the reason people more and more to the sleeve. Some of the patients ask it more because they don't want to have that problem in their minds. So bleeding, <clears throat> bleeding we can do a lot by endoscopy, but we need to differentiate if it's acute, that it will be intraluminal or intraabdominal. Sometimes for intraabdominal, we cannot do that much. Intraluminal, we can do a lot. And when it's chronic, we need to figure it out what happened is there. And endoscopy probably will help us find ulcers, marginal ulcers, that we can do something. We also need to find out what will be the location, because this can bleed, especially acutely, anywhere where you have staplers, anywhere you have anastomosis, remanent, etc. So we need to find out where it is, and if we can reach with the scope. If we can reach with the scope, we can treat it by endoscopy. 
The chronic ones, we can go beat the scope, some we can treat, some no. We just started a, a, a work, a, a study where we are going to suture. We already don't do cases no more. Of marginal ulcer that we suture with endoscopic suturing devices and see how it goes. Uh, and, and, and we cannot publish now because we don't have it yet. But when you have leaks, that is the next problem. When you have a leak of the bypass, when you have a leak of the sleeve, I love the leak of the bypasses. Most of the leak of the bypass, you just need to observe. You just need to make sure you have some good trainer. You stop anticoagulation. And um, most of these patients, they don't need anything. So this is how we do it. And this is, we published this when I was at the Cleveland Clinic with Raul's group. If you have no drains, you just put a drain. If the, you cannot drain it, you go to the OR, you put drains, and you do a gastrostomy because you are in the OR. If the patient is unstable, you need to take it to the OR. If the patient is stable, antibiotics, stent is needed, observation, the bypass leaks are not a problem. In my own experience, most of them close very quick and without complications. <clears throat> if you have to go to surgery, People have to put stitches, etc. Not in words. It's just you go there because you couldn't drain properly. That will be the only reason to go there. Strictures also are much easier to treat with the bypass. And most of them, I would say close to 95% of them, you can treat with endoscopy. So when we look at our surgical anastomosis, we like them 1.3, like 30 millimeters, 15 maximum. When you go by endoscopy, anything below 10 or 9 is a strictures. So we go by fluoroscopy and we go by endoscopy. We try to mix them both, and we're going to do balloon dilations. But let me tell you, I'm going to show you a balloon dilation. Look at these strictures. This patient cannot eat anything, can barely tolerate some fluid. He's vomiting, regurgitation. You go by balloon dilation, and you like it when it bleeds a little bit, and then you can restore the size of the anastomosis. In my own experience, a different of the sleeve in a bypasses, I rather dilate with non-balloon. I, I dilate with the regular bougies. And I keep advancing my bougies until I find the size I want. I find it that they stay longer, that they need less interventions, but that will be me and I cannot teach that because it's not the standard of care. The standard of care is balloons, so I show you balloons. The next problem that we have very common is biliary tract complications. Um, what you're going to have problems is depends on the type of surgery. When you have a sleeve, you do the standard ERCP. When you have a lab band or VSG, you do the standard ERCP. Sometimes you need to do some dilation. When you have a bypass, then you need to stop and think about it because, as you know, it's totally different what you have to do. I want to show you what we're doing different. I know everybody will tell you go by surgery, do a gastrostomy, and do the ERCP. Yes, you can do that, and we've done that, and we published that. But there are some things that we can do now endoscopy. Some are nice, some are crazy, but I'm going to mention what we have been working with. So single and double balloon enteroscopy, it will allow us now to reach much easier the papilla, even with a bypass, and we can reach and do the ERCP. So Peters published long time ago that you can do again the ERCP via gastrostomy. But again, <laughs> you can get problem with endoscopy. Sorry, we can get problem with endoscopy. We can get problem with the RCP. I didn't show you something that uh, maybe was important, uh, but some groups are doing now perforation and stent between the pouch and the remnant. And that way they can go through the stent and do the ERCP. We as bariatric surgeons don't like it because now you create a gastrogastric fistula that if it doesn't close, you're gonna regain weight and have all that. <laughs> this is the sleeve. Imagine guys, this is the sleeve. The new girl in town, best operation ever. Everybody want one? And if you hear the expert today, you can cure diabetes, you can cure any metabolic problem, migraine with the sleep. It's Superman. Yeah. 
Don't believe everything they tell you, you know? So we're gonna see a lot of problems with the sleep. I mean, it doesn't matter who promote it. We know that we're gonna have a big restricted rate. We're gonna have a lot of reflux. We're gonna have a lot of problem with the sleep. So my biggest concern, I mean, for morbidity, it's the leak that we're gonna discuss later. But for what is gonna destroy the sleep if we are not careful will be the, the reflux because the reflux can be published up to 20% in some publications. This one for me is one of the most significant publications from reflux and the sleeve and the bypass. Look at this. If you see the above line, it doesn't matter, yes. GERD is much worse with sleeve. You cannot solve really reflux when you do a sleeve. We can resolve a lot if you do a bypass. It's not perfect, but it's better. But if you see the table below, is if you have reflux before the sleeve, or you didn't have reflux before the sleeve, look at the difference in these three parameters. If you have reflux before sleep, complications are higher, revisions are higher, and you fail more in half weight loss. So not only you're going to have more problems, but you can also have more failures. So reflux before the sleep, if it's significant reflux, should be a no indication to do a sleep. This is, the, we published this already two times, the last one in the book of The Perfect Sleep. We needed to develop our own algorithm to try reflux after the sleep, and then I'm going to show you what we do. Because it's so complex, the problem that converting to a bypass is the easy solution. But when you see a lot of these patients, as we do, because we get a lot of referrals from many places, most of the patients, they did go to the sleep because they didn't want a bypass. And now you tell them after six months, one year, that now they need a bypass. They don't accept it. So if the patient have normal anatomy with good weight loss, we give them conservative treatment. If it works, we don't do anything else. If it doesn't work, we do two types of endoscopic interventions. We do dilation of the sleep to reduce the pressure with balloons, acalasia balloons, and we do radio frequency like a strata to increase the pressure of the sphincter. I don't like a strata for primaries, but it works well when you have this type of problem. If it doesn't work, we convert. But why I'm, why I'm gonna try to change normal anatomy and good weight loss, we just need to focus in the reflux. If you have abnormal anatomy and you have inadequate weight loss, it's very easy. You go to a bypass, that's a very easy one. Endoscopy doesn't have a role. In the middle, when you have abnormal anatomy, but good weight loss, you need to look if you have hiatal hernia or dilated fundus, endoscopy doesn't have a role there. This patient has to go to surgery. When you have a strictures kink, then endoscopy have a big role again, because we learn, especially with the strictures, if we dilate with a calatia balloon aggressively up to three times if necessary, 97 to 98% of these strictures are gone and the reflux is treated. So we have a role for endoscopy there. So we can create a stenosis for many reasons. Some of them we can repair, some of them don't. We published this in 2010 uh, about the strictures, and we say there that we can do some things like uh, knife myotomies, we dilate with a galasha balloon, the editorial almost kill us, that we were crazy, that all the strictures have to go to bypass, but that's what most of the people do today. And that's what I suggest. You observe, if the patient cannot uh, tolerate food, then you go for endoscopic dilation. I don't like seromyotomies. Uh, I spoke even with Jack Himpis, they are not doing it anymore. Uh, some people converted to bypass very quick. But I, I like to think that you need to go and evaluate very well the size of the stricture, the length of the stricture, and when you have a small stricture that is not very long, always a, a, a endoscopy has a role. When you have a long stricture that is a, a very, very, very narrow, maybe you will think it in the bypass already. How we do that? We do pneumatic dilation with a Galatia balloon. And I want you to tell you very quick what we do. We use fluoroscopy, we do endoscopy, and we are very aggressive. And I want to show you one case that has also a leak. You can see up there 
there is a leak when you see like purple. So remember, every time you have a leak, if it doesn't close easy, it's because you have a structure or a high pressure system. So we identify the leak. And then as we, as we advance, we're going to look how strict it is, as you can see in the endoscopy there. So this one we're going to dilate, because if we are able to reconnect and dilate all this body of the stomach, we will improve. Look at this structure. We need to dilate that one, at least try to dilate them in two or three times to treat the fistula. As you move back, as you move down, start to open again. So you don't need to dilate that one. So look what we do. You go by fluoroscopy, you are in the endoscopy, you control exactly where you are. We use some clips as mark outside of the patient so we know exactly where we are. And then we dilate with the balloon under fluoroscopy control until it opens. And yes, sometimes we like to see some bleeding there in the in the in the circumference because it makes you did a good one. The GIs don't like to do that. They they do a calatia balloon for two minutes. We leave this balloon for five or six minutes with 35 psi, and, and that's very concerning to them. But look how it opened. And then at the end, you get a very good tube that probably will also help you to close the leak and you treat the stretches. The leak is, uh, uh, as, as I hear some friends call it, the mother of all storms. The leak of the sleeve, for that reason, for the high pressure system, because you don't have vascularization there, is high. Even that it's been published that the risk of leak is up to 2.4%. This is the people who publish. What we get from other places that they don't do 50, 100 a year, they do 20, 30, the leak is higher. And then we need to define if it's proximal location, if we can manage by endoscopy, or uh, what to do with them. And in the past, after we did the international consensus with the Cleveland Clinic, we decided that <clears throat> most of them will be treated with a mixture of dilation and stents. And as you are aware, we move away a little bit from that. Early ones, we seven days we don't do much. We do like the bypass. From 7 to 14 days, we try to use stents and dilation. After that, they don't work much. Uh, the other thing we've been doing that is interesting is uh, we either suture in place the stent, because one of the big problems of the stent, they move, as you can see here. We anchor that stent, and it's been helping a lot. The problem is the cost. The device is like $2,500 to put two stitches in a, in a stent. So that's very difficult. But what we're doing is we use the device to suture the leak. And then above that suture, or in the luminal, we put the stent and we suture it. So we use the device for many things, suturing and stent, and it's been working for some of the cases. But when this, this some of the group published this, the, the stents we have in the US are not good. We have to put two. The, there are some very good stents in Korea and Argentina that have the shape of the sleeve. Uh, if you place it at the right time, if you fix it, the, there is a very low uh, complication rate, but there is a very high success rate. But we need to move some other stuff. And as you can see, like this publication, is the pigtail. Some groups are using pigtails, and I think pigtail is the way to go now for some of those leaks for after uh, 7, 14 days before they become chronic. The thing with the pigtails, you need to take care more of the patient. I know some people are using vac sponges that keep the patient in the hospital for a month or so. You need to take care of that every day or every other day. With the pigtail stone, you can send the patient home, you can put the pigtail, then you can remove them. And as you can see here, again, you can use endoscopy, fluoroscopy, and you position very well the pigtails where you want them to be, and that will treat most of the leaks if needed. The chronic leak, we published in this Sage's manual a long time ago, uh, there had been the second one, a gastric septotomy for the chronic abscesses and the chronic drains. And also they almost kill us again. But that's what we do now. We do in a chronic fistula, we do dilation. We do, as you can see down below, septotomy, where we make sure that both holes, the fistula hole and the lumen hole, they are at the same level. So then gravity won't take it to the fistula because the fistula is also higher here. So most of the gravity will take the leak to the fistula. If you lever them, 
then they go to both sides and the fistula starts to close. And this has been working very well for our chronic fistulas. <clears throat> so this is scary, chronic fistulas. I've seen patients two years, one and a half years in a hospital in Brazil, for example, because of chronic fistula. So we cannot do the same with chronic fistula like we do here. We put them in stands, we take them to the OR, this is the best example of what Einstein said. You don't expect to do the same thing and then get a different result. But it's not going to happen. You need to do something different because if it doesn't work, the septotomy, you end up doing transection, big surgeries, total transection of the anastomosis, esophago jejunostomies, and that will be a problem. So for us, when we published in 2010 what you do for these patients, depends what you find, depends the patient history, depends why you're doing this to the patients. But more important, and that is uh, my last slide, is surgeons like to think with their brain and with their heart. So surgeons, we have the tendency to think that <clears throat> one complication, one failure of a surgery, we can solve with another surgery. <clears throat> if you have a leak, let's do a surgery to prevent the leak. If we have a structure, let's do a surgery. We, lose, we don't lose weight, do another surgery. We regain weight, do another surgery. I think it's about time that we think with the heart, with the brain, admit surgery is not perfect, and most of the problems we can solve between endoscopy, percutaneous intervention, radiology, and also will be much cost effective for the system and for the patient. Maybe it won't be that good for us economically, but it will be good for everybody. <laughs> so I want to thank you again for, for, the, for the invitation. And, and, and I know it was a long topic, but I hope you, you kind of enjoy. Thank you very much, guys, and good to see you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Junior. It was a really a very exciting, entertaining speech you gave, and like drinking a Colombian coffee. I think I am having our uh, Bangladesh Society of Surgeons President, Dr. Togidil Alam, to give the formal vote of thanks uh, in this August gathering. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you.